Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave, and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand, and he's running really fast. And spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. That's theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the connection section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me. Just get a hold of me. And before we get into this week's Art Bell iTunes five-star reviews, let's talk about YouTube. You see, if you were a subscriber to me on YouTube, you are no longer a subscriber because we had some unfortunate circumstances that led to us taking the YouTube channel down and starting a brand new one. So if you were subscribing and there's about 3,400 of you that had subscribed to YouTube, you are no longer a subscriber. And if you're interested, go ahead and resubscribe. Just look up the confessionals and you'll see that channel pop up. Just hit resubscribe and we're going to rebuild this channel. So if you were interested in following us on YouTube, we put the show up there and a lot of extra stuff that I come up with a lot of crazy stuff. So if you are a fan of the show or things that I do on the side, you're definitely going to enjoy the YouTube channel. So go ahead and subscribe today. And also while we're talking about subscribing, why don't you all go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. And at the top menu, you'll see a section for the newsletter. Go ahead and click on that and subscribe to the newsletter because there's a lot of new information coming out down the pike here in the next month and a half to two months that you're going to want to be subscribed to the newsletter. So you get the first heads up about. So go ahead and do that now. And without any further delay, let's get to the shout outs. The Art Bell iTunes five star shout outs is Go Big Orange One, Lawrence 88, Pam Purple Rose, It's Moth, Arc Bills Fan, and Pika Poocher. I have no idea what that means, but awesome. Anyways, thanks for going to iTunes and leaving an Art Bell iTunes five-star rating and review. It means a lot to me that you guys are supporting the show by leaving those five-star rating and reviews. Now, moving on to the Patreon shoutouts, we have some new patrons. Anybody who goes to patreon.com forward slash the confessionals and signs up to become a patron, you'll get a shout-out on the following week's show. And this week's shout-outs is Lisa F., Amy D., Scott M., Rebecca R., Latita V., and Logan L., Thanks so much for going to patreon.com forward slash the confessionals and signing up to become a patron to help support the show on a monthly basis. It means a lot to me and I really do appreciate it. Now let's get into this week's show. We have a duo coming on, a mother daughter duo coming on to share their paranormal experiences, UFO experiences, and even men in black experiences where they were actually followed by a vehicle with government plates kind of escorting them out of the state. And they had this feeling that it was the men in black. All right, today we have a pair of guests coming on. We have Kendall and her mom, Rachel. How are you ladies doing? We're doing good, doing good. Great. So uh, for everybody to know, Kendall reached out to me and uh, she had a lot of different experiences she wanted to share. And then she said that, you know, her mom would be good to come on with her to share some of these experiences that they've had because they actually experienced some of it together. Uh, But before we get into any of that stuff, uh, Rachel... I would like to talk to you. Now, this apparently happened. You were there. And uh, this is Kendall's grandparents, your parents. And Mm -hmm. you guys experienced 
a situation where you guys were stargazing and kind of looking for UFOs or whatever, and you actually were chased by the men in black. Could you tell us about that? Yes. So um, we were actually visiting this time um, from the Portland area. My father grew up um, in Idaho, and um, it was common for people to, um, the kids to see UFOs at that time. Um, and they all talked about it together. And so I was interested in looking for UFOs and looking at the stars. My mom didn't want to go. Kendall did not want to go. They stayed behind at the hotel. And me and my father um, went to out to the valley, way, way out um, along a very desolate country road to get a good view away from any kind of light. And we sat there for a while and, and you know, we're just looking at the stars and things. And, um, and all of a sudden, um, a car drove by. It was really unusual because at this time of night in Idaho, it's um, very quiet. Towns shut down pretty fast, especially the small towns, especially that far out. And then um, the next thing we knew, there was there we got in the car and we were driving, and there was cars following us. And at that time, my father had a um, it what looked like kind of like a police car, a, a, one of those Crown Victorias. It was brand new, but you know they used them for police cars then. And it was black and we were followed by three other of those cars and they would every turn. My dad um, was conscious that they were falling behind us and every single turn that we made, they made. And like I said, we were way out in the country and they um, we had to um, drive out on the freeway. They followed us on the freeway all the way to the Oregon border. We were staying in Ontario before they turned around. And it was late at night. It was very disconcerting, and we couldn't understand why they were following. They didn't actually make contact with us, but they were right on our tail following us that whole way till we left the state. And this valley is right next to Oregon. I mean, we were probably 30 miles into Idaho from Ontario. Um, But it was a very unusual situation, and they actually chased us out of the state. (laughs) Wow. So let me ask you a question. So are you guys in Canada right now? No, we're in Idaho. Oh, you're we, in we Idaho. We moved to Idaho. We, we were, at the time, we'd been living in Portland. My dad is from Idaho. And um, we, w- we would visit here. You know, it's his home, you know, growing up. So we would visit. And so we had um, come for a visit. And um, my my father and I are interested in, in the UFO phenomena and things like that. So my, my mother's not as interested in that. And Kendall was a little girl at that time. She was maybe six, five or six. Okay. And she stayed behind because it was late at night, stayed behind with my mother. So me and my father would go out late at night looking because the sun goes down in the summer here very late. Um, we're kind of on the edge of the time zone. So it's, it's 10 or you know, almost 11 by the time it's dark enough to be wow. able to stargaze, you know. So that's why we were out very, very late. And I had my cameras and stuff. I was hoping to see if I could get something on film. Um, so, so, yeah, so that was very scary. We were actually very, very scared. We didn't know what they were, why these people, they were blacked out windowed um, Crown Victorias. And at the time, those cars were all brand new. And they actually, they stayed on our tail and followed us all the way to the Oregon border. So your dad had a Crown Vic and these were Crown Vics as well, right? Yes, yes. My dad had a Crown Vic. That's the kind of car he liked to drive. It was brand new at that time. And yeah, then these other ones, but these other ones were blacked out window ones. They were government cars. So you actually got a good look at these cars as far as like license plates and stuff. Or, so you, you know, yeah, that I can see the license plates. I could see they were government cars, but I couldn't see who was in them because they, it was dark and the windows were dark, you know, blacked out. So I could not see who was in the car. Wow. And so they didn't they, try and pull us over. They just followed us like they're like followed us till we got to the Oregon border. Then they stopped and turned around. So they were government plates as in like they said, like u.s government on it or was it like yeah uh, they were they didn't look like normal plates they were those weird looking um like with the the symbol yeah they were like the white kind of of plates like whited out maybe with the they weren't normal plates that you'd see on the regular cars you know the ones that like say i i the u.s government you know what i mean right I hear about these people saying that they have these run-ins with the men in black and stuff. Uh, now, men in black, you know, was 
culturalized by the movie Men in Black with Will Smith. Uh, do you think that that is the type of person that was following you guys, or do you think this was more of like a uh, a governmental type of government or agency that was following you guys for whatever reason? I mean, do you did you get the feeling that they knew what you were out there for? I I I don't know why they would even care that anyone was even out there. To tell you the truth, this is like old cornfields, clear out. You don't have to drive very far out of of the, you know these towns to be so far away from anybody. There's no reason for them to even know we were out there. So I don't know if they were. Um, I don't know if they were patrolling that area if we were near some kind of a government thing and that's what it was i'm not aware of anything being out there i mean it's a bunch of farms it's in the desert you know that they they take over on um, the desert and turn it into farm area here i don't know how familiar you are with idaho but not uh, very it's familiar very flat. it's very very flat <laughs> you can see like compared to portland i don't know how it is where you live but it's there's you can see the entire horizon like all the way around you there's no hills or trees it's like being in the Sahara Desert or something. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I Actually, now that I think about it, I was at Idaho one time. I was on a basketball tournament. We were touring a couple different uh, states out there. And I know we played in Idaho uh, at one time. And I do remember it being super flat. But I think I think I remember... I, I don't remember. But yeah, Idaho is, is definitely a flat state. So, I mean, I imagine at nighttime, you get pretty good vantage points at the sky. Yeah, you can see the sky's huge here. You um, you know, you get to stop along the road and just as long as it's dark enough, you have a really good view of the stars and just anything that might be, you know, in the air. So, but there wouldn't have been any reason for them to even care. I mean, I don't even know why anyone would even care that we're sitting along the road out there, but apparently, you know, we weren't welcome to sit out there. Or how they'd even know you were there. I, yeah. I don't even know how anyone even knew we were out there. I mean, it's desolate out there. Yeah, it's, it's just very odd. Now, uh, I had a lady on my show a while back. She's from Canada. And she talked about how when her and her friend were going to her friend's boyfriend's house, they were like 16 or something. Uh, they entered into some kind of weird time slip where they were driving down a road they were very familiar with, but everything was out of order. And not one time over a three hour process did her boyfriend's house come up. And uh, they, they were scared and they felt like they were never going to get out of this weird loop. And uh, they finally did and when they did they decided just to turn around go back home kind of thing but when they when they took when they were leaving i think she said it was like three or four blacked out suvs uh came out onto the road and i think she said it fo- they followed her and her friend off the road or out of the area or something and it was just very weird and and coincidental maybe that you know three <laughs> blacked out vehicles appear on a, a road that nobody else has been on for three hours and they had this whole experience and i just wonder sometimes i think i even mentioned on the show like if they somehow knew she was her and her friend where they were going because the fact that they they recognized things on the road but they didn't actually uh they, they weren't in order and they never saw the, the, the boyfriend's house kind of makes you feel like if somebody was actually controlling the situation that uh, they knew where they were going and how did they know that? And I bring that up because, you know, if these people that followed you and your dad out of the area, it's almost like they knew what you were out there for and they didn't want you to be out there for whatever reason. Was it intentional? Like, did, did they, did it seem like they wanted you to know they were there? Oh yeah. They, they yeah. There was no way that you would not know they were there. They were right on us. Okay. And I, I was scared the whole way. I was like, what, are we in trouble? Are we getting pulled over? You know, but no one ever turned on any light. Um, it was, it was really scary. I, I can imagine. I mean, I've never been followed by uh, anything other than a cop with the lights on saying I was running a red light or something like that. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, even that can be nerve wracking, right? So, I mean, being followed by these vehicles that late at night. Now, uh, they're following you and mm-hmm. you get a you look at the plates. So, I'm assuming the plates were on the front of the car as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So, I, I saw um, one of the white plates, you know, that white with the black but I, I didn't get to read it because my dad was trying to get go away without getting in trouble, you know, trying to <laughs> just drive and make turns and see if they continued to follow us. And then when we got on the freeway, so I was trying to turn around and, and look and, and not be, I didn't want to seem like I was being weird or suspicious or <laughs> I, I don't know. We didn't know what to do. 
So, um, so yeah, I, I saw the flash of one of the white plates, and, and in my mind, that was one of those U.S. government plates. Um, yeah. Now, was there ever a time in the car with your dad during this situation where you guys thought about or talked about pulling over to see if they would just drive by? Um, no, my, my dad didn't want to pull over. <laughs> I can understand that, you know, but you hear different people's stories and stuff. And sometimes people will pull over and let somebody get by. It's like, Hey, this guy's being an idiot, you know, you know, ta- keeping, ta- uh, you know, tagging me on, you know, my bumper mm-hmm. kind of thing. Uh, so it, it's very interesting story for sure. And I, I honestly don't know what to make of it, but what makes you th- say that uh, it's the men in black though? Is that just a generalization or was there something that really stood out to you to make you feel it like- was just, it was just a generalization. Um, we couldn't think of why they would want, you know, to, you know, suddenly show up when we're trying to look at U- UFOs and stuff like that. I mean, in that valley, um, my dad growing up, it was common for the kids to lay down on the hill and watch the UFOs come in. Now, whether they're, I, and I, I, I say UFOs because I didn't see themselves, but this area is directly in line with Area 51. Mm-hmm. It's straight up from Nevada. So, but they said they used to see some kind of, they call them UFOs and I didn't see it myself, but come in and they'd lay down and watch them come right over the top of them. And I, my dad used to talk about it when I was a kid and um, that's why I wanted to come out here and look at them. Um, I didn't end up seeing any, but I had that experience with the government cars, but um, I, I was always suspicious as a kid because I had never seen it before. And so we had come and visited a woman that my dad had grown up with that was very religious. And um, she actually was going to a a church that I was familiar with. We visited her and I was so surprised. And then I, you know, I was, I believed him after that, that this was really happening when he said, do you remember the UFOs we used to see, you know, um, you know, when we were kids and, you know, teenagers laying down on the hills. And she said, yes, she goes, he's flying right over the top of us. And, to hear how this person, usually religious people will not talk about UFOs that way. And to hear her say that, I was just amazed and surprised. And I believe, you know, I was believed more in the phenomenon. And since then, I have seen a UFO myself or what I thought might have been a some kind of ship. Maybe they were testing something, but I have seen some phenomenon myself since then. Well, what, why don't you describe that while we're on the topic and stuff? Uh, oh. I mean... I, I, I've, for, for one, people who don't listen to my show all the way through from beginning to very, very end, don't, they don't know this, but I'll share with you, uh, because I added as a bonus content after the, the music. And sometimes I do that just to, you know, have some fun and I let people hear some extra stuff if they make it through the whole show. Uh, but I actually, maybe a month or two, man, probably about a month ago, uh, I saw a UFO. I'm a truck driver during the day and I'm driving down the turnpike and I see this UFO. Uh, long story short, I actually saw it two other times within a month period of time. And uh, it was very odd. I don't know what it is. I still don't. But uh, you see this UFO and what about it made you feel like this is something out of the ordinary? Well, um, I've seen a couple. So the first one I I saw was we were at the beach. My grandparents had a home at the beach. And Kendall actually says she remembers that she was old enough to remember at this time. Um, so I, I after the experience with my dad, I was even more interested. I was like, what do people not want us to see here? So we I started paying even more attention to the sky. So we were out at the beach. It's really dark. We're whole families out there. And just staring at the sky, and um, all this, all of a sudden, I see these um, stars clear up, um, way up high, moving. A set of three of them, and they're moving. And as they move over, other stars are blacked out, and then come back as it moves. Like, and did yeah, you see it? well, like if you took a triangle and put a star at each point, mm-hmm. but you couldn't see the the triangle inside. Um, but when it moved over the other stars, the space in inside the three points that were moving were blacked out. Yes, it was like it was like it was invisible, but what was behind it you couldn't see. That makes sense. Yeah. So then, you- when it got to a certain point, it each um, it kind of got to a certain point in the sky, and then it it shut each one of the lights off on each corners, each one of the corners, and then we couldn't see it anymore. Yeah. We actually watched it for quite a ways going across the sky. Yeah. 
Now, what about it? Like, do you, do you think, I guess what I'll ask you first is, uh, what do you think UFOs are? Now, some people say it's extraterrestrial. Some say it's governmental. Some say it's both, that there are different types of UFOs. Uh, what kind of vibe did you have in going on in your mind when you guys saw this? I mean, was it like, this is extraterrestrial or were you scared that, you know, on that aspect of things, were you more curious because you're like, dude, this is an actual government, you know, flying object that we have never seen before. I could go either way. I mean, I, I, I think that there's both. Yeah. Personally, I think the government has a lot of um, tools at their disposal that they don't share with everybody. And I could go either way. I mean, I could not see it, the actual ship well enough, you know, it was an outline that was covering stars. Um, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. No. I mean, it's different. That one was totally different than the other ones that we've seen. Like, but yeah, I'm, I'm the same as my mom. I think that they have, there's both types, you know, but as far as the vibe goes, I was, as a kid, I was, you know, just fascinated because I've heard grown up, heard stories about my grandpa's experiences, Mm -hmm. getting chased by UFOs and seeing UFOs as a kid and everything. And so I, was like, oh, yes, like I finally saw one. <laughs> yeah, we were actually, there were so many of us standing there. Um, there was the whole family. There was like eight or nine of us, and we all saw it. And I think that mostly the vibe was just we were all excited that everyone got to see it. It wasn't like this one person saying, oh, we saw it, you know, and the other people have to just believe. We actually all saw it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so no one could really, like, deny it. We didn't feel in danger or anything. Yeah, no, nothing like that. No. It was just a really unusual sighting. And it it was really far up in the sky for being an airplane. Yeah, for being Um, something like that. Because it didn't move like that. It was moving slow. Yeah. And it was out because you could kind of see, like, it was right by the, you know, by the Pacific, you know, she lived on the beach. Yeah. So So it must have been, you know, way out there over the ocean, you know, from where we were, because we were up pretty high um, elevation wise, you know, on, on the coast. So we could see over the top of, you know, all the stuff, the land and everything. So where that was in the sky had to have been over the ocean. Okay. So let me ask you this. I mean, it, a lot of times I talk to people and they saw a UFO. It, I mean, more often than not, it's somebody that experiences a UFO, but they don't have anybody to share it with. You saw this with other people. Uh, what was the situation like after this experience? Uh, because some people say that th- weird things happen where it's like you experience a UFO and nobody talks about it. And, and it's just like it never happened. But Sometimes people say that everybody's freaked out. Everybody's talking about it. Were you guys all talking about it together in the moment? Or was it something like, it was just like, almost like you're um, mesmerized to the point that nobody talked about it or maybe hypnotized, some people would say. Um, we um, we all talked about it. Yeah. We did a lot of talking about it, about what it could be. We were, um, we were just so excited that everybody saw it because it it seemed like we were always having situations where only one person saw it or two and and we're just um yeah we were just just excited yeah (laughs) like watching out like a home run or something believe it happened because we we were sitting out there and we always watch the sky and yeah 99 percent of the time you never see anything so we were just excited that we had thought something yeah but we weren't like we weren't in that trance kind of state or anything like that no we were all totally there and excited (laughs) the the other one that me and kendall saw we were we were kind of stunned by that talking about the bridge one one, yeah Yeah. the light i don't know what that was (laughs) yeah the other one that kind of did happen yeah well why don't you guys go into that then Uh, okay so that one we were on the I-205 bridge. Yeah, the I-205 bridge. And we were, I was old enough to sit in the front seat of my mom's car. You're actually like 15 or something. Yeah, I was pretty old. I was like 15. And um, so we were kind of stuck in traffic. And like, you know how you're look, you're on a bridge or a road and you're just looking straight ahead at all the cars in front of you? Sure. Um, well, right on in front of the bridge, like if you're heading the direction we were, was the, the PDX airport. And in Portland. And um, so we were coming from Vancouver, Washington, 
to back to Portland because my grandparents lived in Vancouver and we were, you know, sitting in the car in traffic. And all of a sudden, like I, both of us just noticed this weird blue light that was, you know, it wasn't the same color as the sky, you know, it was brighter and it was hovering at street level kind of the street light level. Yeah. Like where the street lights would be if you're, if you're looking straight ahead and you know, the street lights on the bridge, it was right. Like, in the same level at the, in the sky as that. And what happened was we were staring at it for a a while. And then all of a sudden it kind of moved a little bit and then went to one side and then shot up and disappeared. And me and my mom both like looked at each other and we're like, uh, what was that? (laughs) Yeah. I was like, you see that blue, like we talked about a little bit first, because even though it was, it was up in front of us, um, and it just looked like it didn't look like a UF. It looked like a blue um, ball of light. And yeah. as we were looking, I was kind of glancing around. I was driving. I was like, "Doesn't anyone else see this thing?" And um, it was in it. It stayed kind of at street light level, which is up a little bit high. Um, but it was kind of over the freeway. And then, yeah, it did. It just shot. It kind of wavered a little bit side to side. It shot straight up, mm-hmm. super fast, and was gone yeah it just disappeared well, we looked at it for a little, a little while i mean we went across the bridge and it stayed we could still see it up ahead of us there and then then it shot up yeah it was really really strange but i there wasn't like a body to it like a ufo it was a, a yeah. really it was like a ball of blue light yeah it was just like an orb you know but the way i remember it wasn't defined as a circle well i mean you know it was a circle but it it, it kind of taped the color like tapered yeah, it out it did it did kind of you know what i mean so it'd be like really the intense blue in the middle and then it didn't have like an edge to it it just kind of faded that's interesting that that's very interesting uh you know it, it's interesting when you experience something like that with a lot of people around and I'm the same boat. I mean, I, I saw this UFO down the turnpike. I'm thinking to myself, is anybody else seeing this? I mean, I, I, I'm looking at a craft that you can clearly see the body of, and it's not like a plane. It, it, like If you're going to call it wings, one wing was shorter than the other, and it was hovering in the sky, probably about two, 300 feet up in the sky. I mean, I clearly could see it. And I'm thinking to myself, does anybody else see this? Did you notice anybody else paying attention to this at, at all i didn't we were um there was a couple cars ahead of us and I was, i'm trying I'm looking at this thing i'm kind of glancing around i'm trying to drive on the highway <laughs> um you know trying to be careful and and i did glance around i didn't notice anybody um but i couldn't see real well because like, the freeway wasn't that crowded and um Mostly, I just kept trying to look back at it, and I'm it was because it was in front of me, and but I'm just trying to drive and look at it, and I'm like, "What in the world is this?" Um, me and Kendall are kind of discussing, like, "You see this? I I see it. What is that?" I we were just stunned by it. Yeah, you know, you guys live in a great area of the country. I, I'm actually jealous because uh, you guys get a lot of UFO sightings out there. You, you, you have Bigfoot sightings left and right. Uh, what else? You have earthquakes. You know what I mean, like no, yeah. volcanoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I know that's not good. That's not good. But I mean, I hear people's stories, and and so much comes out of the Northwest of this country. It's it's. I'm envious, but I appreciate you sharing those experiences and stuff. That's actually bonus because I didn't know we were going to get into all that. Uh, But it's really cool because, I mean, like I said, it's not a lot of times people experience these kind of things together with other people. And it actually, I'm sure in your situation, it helps you because it's like, okay, I'm not insane. They experienced Mm -hmm. it too. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it does. It helps a lot. (laughs) Because you always question yourself. You saw it. (laughs) You're by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I have a friend who saw uh, had a Bigfoot encounter. In fact, that's what uh, made him a believer in it. I mean, he's an outdoorsman, still is an outdoorsman, but he's in a tree stand and he sees this thing walk into the tree line. And for years, he is like, I, I had this experience. He, he, he went out on a, a Bigfoot hunt once with the BFRO. I mean, he really got into it. And then over time, as time became a separator between him and that actual event, he started questioning himself. Did I really see what I actually saw? And the last time I talked to him about it, that's what his stance was. He's like, I don't know. I, I, I sometimes I wonder if I actually even saw what I actually, what I say I saw. And so, I yeah. mean, mm-hmm. it's at least now you can go through life and say, remember that time? Because, you know, you had experienced it with somebody else. 
That's right. Yeah. No, it does. It is nice. <laughs> you know, we're not all crazy. <laughs> no. So, uh, Kendall, let's let's start knocking through some of these things that you've experienced. Now, is this at a house that you? I'm assuming this is at the house you used to live in, right? Where uh, when I think you said you were three years old or somewhere around that age, you saw a man in blue overalls that woke you up. Could you share us that story? Yeah, yeah. So this, um, for me, this was my first experience in the house. Um, I was about three, about three. About three yeah, so real little kid. And in my, in the house, I sent you a diagram of the house just so you can kind of understand. Um, but my bedroom was kind of next to my mom's bedroom. Like it was kind of perpendicular and that house was really old. It had an oil furnace that was kind of make, makeshifted into an oil furnace. Like that's not what it was originally. And so that, that they did that a lot with the oil furnaces back then. It was a sawdust burner is what it was yeah. essentially converted over. But anyway, so um, the oil trucks would come in and fill up this big tank um, in the yard. And then that would, you know, spray oil and it would light inside this thing. And then, yeah. yeah. So it'd pour, you know, spray oil in there and that would light the fire to keep the house. And um, normally I didn't sleep in my bedroom because there was something wrong with that bedroom. Um, my mom had feelings that bad feelings towards the room because of experiences that she had before this happened. Um, but so my dad, I must've fallen asleep in the living room or something. And my dad, you know, put me in my bedroom to sleep. And so I wasn't in the room with my parents and they were asleep. And, um, I kind of remember the dream. Um, my, I woke up and I saw this man in blue overall. And he said, you know, go wake up your parents or, you know, something to that effect. And so I ran to my bed near my mom's room because, you know, I'm not used to sleeping in my room anyway. And some dude just woke me up. And so I ran in there and I, you know, woke up my parents and they, you know, I was three and I didn't realize that there was smoke in the house. And, um, you know, I didn't, couldn't make that connection. But when they woke up, my parents realized that the oil furnace was on fire. And um, so my dad, you know, awake and ran down there and put out the fire and was fiddling with that. And I was talking to my mom. And so my mom can probably, she'll, she's better at telling mm-hmm. this part because she was, you know, I was three. So <laughs> yeah. I'll let her finish it. She, she described that the, this man had woken her up and she had, she described what he was wearing and, and she described a man in overalls, which we live in the city and we she never even never saw men in overalls, so there wouldn't really be any reason. And she kind of described, you know, what he looked like. And she she was very descriptive for being such a little kid. And and but I so I listened to the story and I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it because I was concerned about the whole situation with the smoke and my husband down there trying to stop it. Um, but the next day I went down to the base that my husband was working on the oil furnace again on doing some more stuff to it. And I said, you know, Kendall told me this story about this man waking her up and she, and she told me what he looked like. And I, I just thought it was this kind of a kid thing, you know, and I was telling him that, and he just kind of stopped working. He turned around and looked at me and he had this strange look at his face. And I said, what? And he said, that was Ted. And Ted um, I had, well, there's this whole story behind the house. The house, um, we were, we purchased it from my husband's great uncle who inherited it from the man um, who built it. Um, and which was Ted, which was Ted. And my husband had actually known Ted because as a teenager, many years before, um, he had worked at that house, um, to help Ted, um, cause he was an older man and things. So he knew what he looked like. Anyway, Ted always wore very specific clothes. Um, overall, you know, you looked a certain way <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's, it stunned my husband, um, that, yeah. that Kendall was able to describe Ted. Cause Ted had been long dead. Yeah, he died, I think around 1987, 86, somewhere around this happened. Um, I would say in, um, 99. Yeah. I was born in 1996. So he's been gone for a long time <laughs> by then. Wow. But, so, I mean, did Ted know your dad 
very well. Like, I mean, was there, I mean, I'm trying to think like, why would Ted, uh, have any motivation to appear like that to, you know, let you know that there was an issue. I mean, do you think that maybe he was still invested in the house? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We think there was in that house, there was multiple things than just Ted there. Um, we, we believe because, well, my parents, my dad was in construction and so that house is very old and my parents remodeled it and stuff. And whenever, they would do any construction on the house, you know, changing the way it originally was. Um, things would start happening, not violent things, really. I mean, uh, some of it, uh, but not, you know, just irritating things, <laughs> you know, to try and deter <laughs> the the work, if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. And I mean, it, it does make sense to me. That's why I asked that it, the only thing that would make sense to me is that he had some kind of attachment to the house still. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. what was he wasn't attached to the family at all, was he? Maybe a little bit. Yeah. I mean, because my great uncle, uh, my dad's my dad's great uncle was um, Ted's son's best friend. And Ted's son died in or, like way before. And so Ted left the house to my dad's uh, uncle. So, and my dad was around, you know, as a teenager, helping him do stuff around the yard because the house was on. It was very weird because we lived in Milwaukee in in the front, the front yard. If you looked out the the front door was a Fred Meyer. So we were kind of in a busy area, but the plot of land that we were on used to be huge and they kind of cut it down and sold it off. So we had about a half acre left left in this really busy area. So we had, it was, it was kind of weird because the house was in the middle of the, the plot of land. And we had about, I counted them one time, we had 50 trees, huge evergreen trees in the yard. So you were kind of in your own world when you're around that house, you know, so you didn't really feel like you were right there in the city, you know? Yeah. You know, I'm looking at the house right now that the picture you sent me and uh, I'll post this on the website so people can actually check it out as stuff as well. But uh, it it definitely just has that look. Now, I just saw a I just found out about this famous haunted house in Detroit. And it honestly, it reminds me a lot of the house I just saw not too long ago. Uh, When you, Yeah, it really does. (laughs) But uh, when you're in this house and stuff and you, you had, you've had more than just that experience in this house, but of, before we get into any more of these experiences you've had, uh, did it ever feel like this was not a good situation or was it more like menacing? Um, it was menacing almost every day. Yes. Um, I mean, Ted wasn't going to hurt anybody. You know, he, he was there either, even if he was just there to protect the house, you know, um, that's something, but he wasn't there to hurt anyone. There was something else there. Um, you know, I, uh, as a, as a kid growing up, it was not easy living there. Um, you know, cause I could feel it, um, from the minute you walked in the house or even on the property, um, there was a negative, heavy, very bad feeling. Um, and there were parts of the house that you didn't even want to go into. Uh, you know, but you had to uh, because you live there, <laughs> but you would avoid it at at, at all uh, cost, you know, but eventually you, you just get used to it because we lived there for like 14. 14 years. You know, I grew up there. So, um, yeah, besides Ted, there was definitely something very bad that was there. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, that, I mean, do you think that's two separate situations that happened that brought that uh, bad entity or whatever to the house. I mean, uh, if, if you're not feeling like Ted's the issue and there's another issue in the house, a totally separate situation, do you have any idea as to why or what could have brought that on? I have a couple of theories. Um, I mean, the, the land used to be from my understanding, more of like a farmland that we had a shed that was still in the yard, um, that was used as a butcher house for one thing. Um, the sheds in the garage were separate from the house. They weren't connected at all. Um, so there was, you know, animal slaughtering happening at the house. Ted was in world war one. Um, and my dad said that there was a lot of weird Chinese things that he had brought back from world war one. I don't know if that had any connection, but you know, who knows? He could have brought something with him, you know? 
And um, there was also something, my mom can describe this a little better, but um, there was weird, my dad covered it up when he built the deck in the backyard, but there was weird pentagram type uh, things in the cement. Yeah, Ted liked to do cement work after he retired and he he put in a lot of designs and things that really upset. My mother is very Christian and they really upset her. Um, and I don't know whether it was on purpose. I never met him myself. I don't know really only what other people have told me about him, but, um, there were pentagram shaped things in the back. I don't know why, if he disliked the design or, you know, I don't know why he put them there. I wouldn't ever put anything like that there. And we did try to get rid of it and yeah. cover it up. Yeah. Did you, were you successful at getting rid of it? And also, did you ever happen to take a picture yes. of it? Cause I would love to see this. I, I didn't, I, I mean, there might be pictures. I would have to search through our old picture tubs but at that time. It was kind of before digital cameras. And so, um, yeah, everything's it on was, either. It's in print tubs. Pictures. Everybody <laughs> has those old photographs. So if there's pictures of the back of the house, which I think there probably are, I would have to. We could probably it. look for some for you, but yeah, I could probably find some eventually. I, I know. I mean, I tubs are here at my house full of just photographs that have never been put in photo albums. <laughs> Okay. Uh, now, as far as the pentagram goes, uh, now, I, I, this is not to be offensive or anything, but sometimes people uh, think they see a pentagram, but it's actually mm-hmm. not even the right amount of points on the star kind of thing. Are you sure this was a pentagram? Um, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, it, it is made in kind of a weird way. That's why I said I'm not, I don't know what he was trying to do. It had um, the points made out of concrete and triangles and then the, the middle part. Um, as much as you can do. I mean, he was no by no means an expert in concrete. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they were, purposely, they were purposely put in there in the design. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just a kind of a weird coincidence. It is a weird thing. It's not something I would ever put in a concrete patio. <laughs> Yeah, for any reason. Right. And, and it's something we got rid of yeah, pretty quick. <laughs> I mean, it, are you sure that he put it in there? Yes, yes. I'm sure that he put okay. it in there, yes. This, this is, um, he had, like I said, he built this house. He built onto it to make it a little bigger for his family. And he did all the concrete work. I was told because he couldn't do the butchering any longer. He was bored, um, you know, he, after he's, kind of in his retirement and was doing little weird little, little projects. projects. Wow. Well, it, it sounds like maybe he got into some weird stuff. I don't know, but yeah, uh, I, I, don't, yeah I don't know. <laughs> I, I, like I said, I never met him myself. He was gone long before I was in, in the picture. So, okay. Yeah. I, when you said pentagram, I, my ears perked up. I was like, well, hold on a second. Now we might be getting somewhere. I, I don't, uh, I don't know where else to dig from here because it doesn't sound like you really know a whole lot about this guy. Um, but it makes you wonder, you know, did he get involved in some things, you know, over time that weren't necessarily, uh, pure? Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I wondered sitting in that house, the house was gloomy and because of all the trees. And I can just imagine after his wife was gone, he was just, after she passed, I just, I don't yeah. know. I just imagined him just being in this gloomy house. I don't know. Yeah. Well, Kendall, why don't you talk to us a little bit about some of the other experiences you've had in the house? Uh, if you want, you could start with us just on the fact that you would hear your mom coming home, but she wasn't home. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I was old enough to stay home by myself, you know, probably like nine or 10 And, but I wasn't old enough to watch my younger sister at the time. So I would get home from school, you know, get off the bus, make some food, watch some cartoons or whatever in the living room. And, um, how the living room was set up, it faced directly to the, uh, driveway. And we had a really long driveway that was like U shaped. So you could come in at two different points on the street. And it was really, it wasn't gravel, but it was really kind of like messed up, um, concrete. So like you, it sounded like a gravel road almost, you know? And my mom had um, an Astro van at the time. And the first time it happened, I, you know, obviously jumped up and checked if my mom got home. But I, you know, heard her car pull up in the driveway. I'd hear her in my sister's door because my mom would get off work, go pick up Casey from daycare and then, uh, you know, come home. 
And so I'd hear her in uh, her door and Casey's door, you know, open and shut. And then I'd hear them walk up the steps to the front porch and put her keys in the lock. And um, so I'd hear that sequence like exactly. And the first time it happened, you know, I jumped up when I started hearing uh, the car pull up into the driveway and her walk up the stairs and I look out the window and she's not there. And, you know, it freaked me out <laughs> at first because I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe I'm just, you know, maybe it was just the TV or whatever. And um, then exactly, you know, almost a half an hour later to, on the dot, she that exact same sequence would happen, but she would actually be there. And that started happening at least almost every day that I was home, um, you know, and it would be exactly the same way as she would when she actually got there. Um, so it, that happened all the time, all the time, you know, and it, it just, kept going. So eventually, you know, I just heard, okay, that's the, the first time I heard it. And my mom's going to be home in about a half an hour. <laughs> you know, as a kid, I just got used to it happening. Wow. So, I mean, actually it's beneficial as a kid. Cause you're like, okay, I got 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a warning. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to be home in 30 minutes, so I better wrap this up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, wow, that's that's interesting though. I mean, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, if, if was it consistent though? I mean, was this a consistent thing you hear this and you know like 30 minutes later your mom's going to come home or whatever? Yeah. Mhm. And it wasn't always like um cuz you know, sometimes she would get home later or, you know, earlier or whatever it would be the same um depending on when she would get home so like if she was going to actually get home at five o'clock it would happen at 4 30 or if she was going to get home at 5 15 it would happen at 4 45 you know around that so it would be consistent in that way but you know it would be at different times depending on when she would get home <laughs> okay which is weird <laughs> no i mean it is weird but at, le at least it gives us some consistency. It kind of lets you build a foundation from there as to trying to understand what was going on there. I, I, I don't know. I have no idea what was going on there. But, it, you know, we talked about the time slips before. Uh, it makes you wonder if there's some kind of, I don't know, weird time slip energy thing going on there. I don't, I don't know. I've never heard of that before, but it's, it's interesting at least. Yeah. And I don't know if it, I mean, my theory about that house was, I think it kind of got supercharged because I listen to a lot of, I'm an Uber driver. And so I am in the car all the time. So I have lots of time to listen to like your show all the time and into the fray and coast to coast and stuff. And so over the, over the years, I've heard of like things like water charging energy kind of a thing. And the road we lived on was Oatfield Road, and there's actually a fault line directly underneath the house. Um, and we were on a hill, and it being rainy, like 90% of the time, there was water literally running underground underneath the house down the hill. So I don't know. That's just, I, don't, I think maybe that could, I don't know if there was some sort of like powerhouse happening because of that, <laughs> but it's something that I think about sometimes, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's better than any guess I would have. So yeah, it's just, uh, it's definitely odd. Uh, talk to us about some of the other experiences you've had in that house. I mean, I know you said that you had a lot and I, I don't even know if we could cover them all, but I know you mentioned about experiencing uh, walking up in other rooms above you. Was that a situation where nobody else was home except for you? Um, yeah. And that wouldn't just happen to me though. It happened to everybody. Um, so my mom, um, has had that happen too. And that was like just a regular thing. And you would know that you weren't crazy because you would be in the, the basement at the time. The, um, computer was in the basement and the basement wasn't like finished. It was just an open floor plan, you know? And um, so you could see the whole room and then the staircase coming down and you'd be sitting down there and our dog, Daisy, she was a Springer Spaniel. And um, you'd be sitting down there at the computer playing games or looking at some, whatever, you know, and you'd hear either people walking around down the hallway, you know, cause the, the basement was the entire house, you know, the floor the first floor. So you could walk the perimeter of the whole house down there and um, the dog would look up. 
or you would hear your name being called from up the stairs and the dog would look up at the exact same time you did. <laughs> so you, you kind of knew that you weren't hearing things cause the dog heard it too, you know? Um, so that was, that was one pretty consistent thing that just happened over the years, you know, all the time, all, all the time. You, you, it got, you got kind of used to it. You'd tell it to stop. Yeah. It, it would call me mom or it would call me by name. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And then that basement, I don't know. I mean, and it's very strange that house we moved out of it, you know, almost five years or six oh, years now. Years ago. And it's actually, I went back there just a couple of weeks ago and they have leveled the whole plot. So there's no trees or house there anymore. But a couple of years ago, it was still kind of in the bank was fighting over it and trying to sell it and stuff. And, um, I went back there to just to look at it, you know, with, um, one of my ex-boyfriends and, um, Portland, I don't know if you know anything about it, but they have a pretty high homeless population Yeah. and the house had just been sitting and they had trashed the whole yard. There was garbage everywhere. And there, I went in the house actually, just because I was, you know, curious and, um, they had like broken in the garage door and the whole uh, attic in my mom's bedroom, all the rooms had like drug paraphernalia in it and nasty, you know, but for some reason the basement was pristine exactly the way we left it. No one went down there. There was even an old checkbook that my mom left there three, by three accident. years ago by <laughs> accident. Yeah. It just, I mean, I don't know how we even left wow. that there, but it, yeah. And it was, it wasn't even like a checkbook from like 2010 or something. It was from like, it was from a bank that I no longer had banked with probably for eight or nine years before we even moved. And we had done a pretty thorough looking over of the house when we left it and she found it just sitting. Yeah. It was just sitting and there. And like, not have those kinds of people take that. It's very, it's really odd. <laughs> I just thought it was really weird. That no one, like, it was like no one even dared to go down there, you know? Yeah. That I, mean- and, that would have been a gold mine for them if they would have found it, you know? Yeah. Right. Which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. I was really surprised. I was, I can't believe it even got left there and was sitting because we checked everything really well when we left. I don't know how that would even have happened. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so that would happen. The name's being called and everything. And then, um, um, I guess we can, so we had our dog Daisy, who was a Springer Spaniel and we had, uh, a, kind of adopted this, um, Pomeranian, her name was crazy because she bit through my mom's thumb one time, but so she got that name. Oh, but she hold got, on a second. Yeah. During the email, you said crazy, and I was, I was like, that's a weird spot to put the word crazy. That was the dog's name. Oh, oh yeah. Gotcha. yeah, crazy was their dog's <laughs> name. He was a rescue. Gotcha. It, all, was a rescue. Rescue. it all makes sense <laughs> now. Like got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So crazy and Daisy were um, like best friends. You know, they loved each other so much. And, um, at the time they slept in the, in the, on the stairway, you know, at the bottom of the stairway in the basement, cause there was kind of a gate that we had put for like a baby gate. Cause my sister was little, um, so she couldn't fall down the stairs. And so my, you know, they would sleep down there and she had died. I don't know exactly how many years or months it had been since crazy passed, but my mom was at the bottom of the stairs doing laundry. Cause the laundry room was down there. And, um, I was in the hallway and m- crazy was kind of a burnt orange color. And she was just a big poof ball, you know, she's Pomeranian. And, um, so my mom was at the bottom and I was at the top of the stairs and the staircase kind of lined up with the hallway. So I was in the hallway looking down the stairs and my mom was looking up the stairs because I don't know if we were talking or something. Well, we were but- looking, I was looking for your, we, we were looking for your, um, soccer uniform. <laughs> Yeah, we're a lot of soccer uh, uniforms. Yeah. So I was looking through the, <laughs> through the laundry basket just because we were gonna we needed to be at a soccer game. So um, we were talking to each other about it. You know, her upstairs, me down there, and we both saw it come across the. Yeah, it had no legs, and it was like if you like took Crazy's legs off in her head. You know, there's no head and no legs, just like the body of her poof. You know, her poof just going across the stair the stair entrance you know mm-hmm. it would have been at ground at the level a walking level for Kendall, and it would have been kind of high up for me yeah right. so it was like above mom's head because she was at the bottom of the stairs and it was you know walking level with me so i saw it from one side and my mom saw it from the other side 
And it just, you know, was that her height, dog walking height, you know, just went across the, the stairway, <laughs> floated or whatever, and then disappeared. And we were both like, oh, what? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, you guys both experienced it at the same time. Uh, when it comes to the idea of it resembling the dog, do you feel like this is, uh, it was a dog like entity, or do you think that you're just explaining it that way because that's what it closely resembled? No, I think it was her, actually. I am not sure myself. I, just, I mean, it was the color of her. Yeah, it was, it was the height of her, so that made me assume it was her. Yeah, um, and it was so close to where she had died, you know. So, I don't know. I think it was her, but I could be wrong. <laughs> All I know is I saw a very weird thing that was the color of her with no legs, no head, at the height of Pomeranian would be. And we both saw it from either side, and it was really strange. Yeah, it was it was super weird. Um, wow. So, now, in the email you sent me, you initially started out by just listing some random things that you've experienced. And in that list, you had said, uh, ghost dogs walking around. Is that what you're referring to this whole story? This, this whole story? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And there, I mean, there was dogs, there was crazy. And then there was also like black shadow cats that all of us would see mm-hmm. out of the corner of your eye, you know, cause we, we always had lots of animals, you know, and, but never did we have a black cat no. ever at that house. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily think that was, I don't think that was actually a cat per se for me. I think that was part of the negative entity that was there. Um, maybe showing itself as that or watching. Cause that's not the only shadow. Um, I don't know if in the email I mentioned this, this but i had the the most negative experience that i had um involved uh an owl type shadow thing so i I, there was lots of different shadow animals walking around that were different vibe and feeling than when we saw that orange ball that we thought was crazy yeah i didn't think the orange thing was bad i didn't get a bad feeling when i saw it okay so i mean why don't you tell us about that i mean if this owl entity that you had experience with was the most negative thing you've experienced in the house. Uh, talk to us about it. Okay. So for me, I, I was a very scared kid. Um, I, I don't know why, but I, I would just walk around terrified of things that I would imagine in my head kind of, you know what I mean? Um, like, as a kid, you know, you're, you're, you're like, Oh, the boogeyman's under my bed kind of a thing. And you picture it in your mind. Um, I would walk around the house and kind of be afraid of things that I thought would be around for no reason. You know, it could be just during bright daylight, summer, sunny day, you know, no reason to be afraid, but I would, you know, envision things like that for no reason. But then there was, I knew that there's a difference though, cause you would look and there would be nothing there. Right. So when I got older, this, this happened um, when I was probably 15, 16. So I was, towards the, I was, it was towards the end of us living there. And um, the way our living room was set up, there was like a, an opening that you could look through into the kitchen. So you could like watch TV in the living room from the kitchen. Um, and I stood up, this is the first time I saw it. I stood up from the couch and turned around you know, to walk into the kitchen because you had to kind of walk around in a circle around the wall to get into the kitchen. And I stood up and turned toward the kitchen and there was something on top of the fridge. And the way I remember it is, um, or the way I saw it was there was like, it was almost like something wearing a mask. Like there was something dark behind this owl figure and it was big. It was a big owl. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen a, like a, a snow owl, but it doesn't have the classic owl face. It has the really dark beady eyes in the small, yeah. the small beak in the middle and kind of a, almost a human shaped um, feather outline around its head and it's flat. So it's not like um, a horned owl or something, it's something different, different kind, but that's what it looked like. And it was white, but then there was, you could just see like a blackness, a, a larger blackness behind it. 
and it was watching me and I freaked out and like looked away and looked back and it was gone. And then a couple weeks later, um, I was walking from the living room past the hallway and out of the corner of my eye, I saw it again, but it was lower to the floor and it was smaller. And it was at the very end of the hallway is my mom's bedroom door, like facing you. And her bedroom door was open and it was in the bottom right hand corner of her door. And it was probably about the size of a soccer ball, um, just the head part of it, you know, and her, her room was dark behind it. So her lights were off. Um, and I was, each of these times I was home alone. Um, and I saw it again and I stood there and I actually stared at it and I didn't look away. And then I told it to go away and walked into the kitchen and went on with what I was doing. And then, um, a couple weeks later, it was probably a month later. Um, the, I, it felt like it built up to this, um, sort of thing. So my dad had built kind of a makeshift stairway into the attic inside a closet. So he cut a hole in the wall and a hole in the ceiling in the hall closet so that you, he could put a, um, like a ladder, you know, he built a wooden ladder up to it. Um, cause he put my room up there because by that time Casey was older and I didn't want to share a room with her anymore. And so my dad had built me a new room in the attic. He fixed it up. Um, so I could stay in there and <clears throat> I opened the, the closet door where the stairway was and I go to turn cause he had to walk in and then it was like a 180 turn to go up the stairs. And when I did the turn, I stepped up on the little ledge and I went to step on the stairs. This, the thing that I had been seeing, the owl looking thing, went straight through my face and pushed me back against the wall. And I stood there stunned. And it was, it was kind of like a, a cold rush of air, but I could feel it go through me, if that makes sense. And I fell backwards into the wall. And I couldn't, <laughs> I just left the, the hallway after a minute. I stood there kind of stunned. And then I, I don't even really remember what I did after that. I know I didn't go up there. Um, I think I went and told my mom after that. But I did call me and saw some kind of owl thing. And I went over there and was looking and yeah. telling it to leave us alone. And it just, I don't know what it did or if it, if it, took something from me or if, you know, cause at the time too, I was having a lot of emotional problems. I had a lot of um, depression problems as a teenager and everything. So I don't know if this thing was affecting me like that negative negatively, or if it was draining, you know, my energy or something, but I had a lot of, a lot of emotional problems um, from that as a kid. And before this, um, I had, I had seen, I, I used to have dreams of like for a year, for a couple of years, I had this dream twice a year. Um, one in the early part of the year and the same dream in the later part of the year. And it was me. Um, it was a really long dream, but to make it a little shorter, I basically, there was, I was fighting this demon in the backyard and in the shed where they used to do the butchering. Um, my whole family, uh, sometimes I would be able to save them and sometimes I wouldn't be able to save them. I, but I was always a little kid in my dreams. I remember that I was always, you know, like five or six. I wasn't as old as I am now um, in the dream, but I would, you know, kill it with something, you know, as if it was a physical being. Um, and either it would have killed all my family and pets and stuff in that shed. And then it would come out to fight me in the yard. Um, and then I would either kill it before it and save my family or I wouldn't. <laughs> so, and I had that dream probably five or six times. Um, and it varied a little bit just depending on whether or not I saved everybody. Um, so I think it was the same entity that I saw in my dreams that I saw, but as an owl thing at the house. <laughs> All right. So I want to just, this is, this is not fact. This is not me determining things. I just want to throw some things out there 
that are just start like I have all these pieces running through my head right now, and I don't know if it's going to make sense when I say it, but I I gotta say it. Uh, the guy that built the house that originally owned it, his name was Ted, right? Yeah. Okay. And did you say that he was a butcher at one time? Yes, that's what he did. After, I believe after World War One, yeah, he, he built the house and he had the butcher shop, which was our shed in the backyard. Where was the uh, the pentagram? Again, the pentagram was in the backyard. It was like the patio that butted up to the back of the house. All right. How close was it to the shed? Oh, 20 feet. Not very far. 20, 30 feet. Yeah, it wasn't it, the whole the shed was pretty close to the, the back, the back, the house. Yeah. I mean, it was it, you didn't have to, like, walk a distance or anything. It was just right there. All right. Uh I, I just find it interesting that you had a pen and this is all happened to the same house, right? Everything you've talked about. Yeah. Everything's yeah. the same house. Okay. Yeah. I, I just, I find this interesting. It's, it's probably nothing, but uh, you have this pentagram. This guy is a butcher. Uh, and I don't know if it's like symbolic being a butcher, but uh, an owl is commonly worshiped by um satanists uh they they call it the god the god is called moloch and uh it's often depicted as an owl and the in fact there's a big conspiracy about bohemian grove in california and in those pictures there's a giant owl that these elitists gather around on a yearly basis and they worship it and i didn't know that (laughs) yeah i knew it wasn't something good (laughs) but i didn't know you know yeah well, what? <laughs> I, Moloch is often referred to. It's a it's a deity uh, that is like a Canaanite god from the Bible, the biblical era, and it's often associated with child sacrifice. And with the experience that you had in real life, person plus the dream, I just wonder if there's something on a deeper level that you were experiencing that you just didn't have the pieces to put together and i i'm still i'm just taking random pieces of information that i know and i'm throwing them all out there and uh, i don't know if it makes sense or not but uh it, it's oh, just no, odd. It, makes sense. it is very it, weird it, the whole thing was that she wasn't the only one that had dreams i used to have really regular terrible dreams of things being it, in my dreams this is, might sound really strange but um i dreamed that bathrooms were haunted that um that I'd go somewhere and I'd immediately know that this, that the bathroom's haunted. I couldn't move in my dream and I would know that it's some sort of a female spirit. And, um, it, and I would dream that all the time myself. I had weird dreams also different than what Kendall was dreaming, but I suffered, you know, insomnia because I wake up from these bad dreams all the time. Um, my, um, headboard would bang at night all the time. Um, against the wall so I'd have to put pillows against it to stop it so I could sleep um we we had a lot of weird things happening in that house yeah so much so that weird became normal yeah and we couldn't leave because of financial circumstances so we were there for the whole time (laughs) yeah so and when I was finally able to get us out of there yeah you know I'm happy and I mean other physical stuff happened too, like to the house, like um, I'll let my mom kind of talk about it, but she had like beer cans thrown, oh, chandeliers yes. fall off the ceiling. <laughs> yes. So um, this would have been early, you know, when we first moved in, my husband, and I, Kendall was um, still very little. This was even before that oil fire thing um, that happened. Um, so we had moved in. Kendall was on one of her first sleepovers at grandma. So my husband and I were sitting at the house. We were watching a movie. And I don't know if you saw the layout of the house, but um, we put the couch up against that spot with the open spot where you could see through the kitchen. So the couch was against that short wall and we sit and watch TV. And over to the right was one of the, the doors to Kendall's bedroom. And I kept the light on in there just because it's scary things kind of happening so the light was on in there the door was partially shut so it wasn't shine on the tv so we were watching a movie it was at night and um so we're sitting there and we had a couch that was one of those futon styles back then with the wood arms you could you could almost kind of use as a table um you know my husband was drinking a beer and he had it 
sit there on the arm. It's a pretty wide arm, um, you know, so you could set something there and it wouldn't fall over or anything. And so we're just sitting there and all during this movie, I kept seeing something out of the corner of my eye above the door in Kendall's room just kind of flip by because it was partially open and the light was on in there and it looked and it was black and I could I couldn't see what it was it was like it was just something it kept catching my eye something flitting by constantly and I tried to ignore it you know watch the movie and unbeknownst to me my husband was also seeing that although he he does not like any kind of activity weird and he doesn't like to talk about it but he was also seeing it we didn't talk about it at the time but um while we're sitting there all of a sudden his beer can he had finished his beer it was just sitting there it cracked in like if you'd taken your hand and squished it and then it flew straight across kind of at an upward angle straight across the room and it hit the wall on the other side by the front door and after that happened we and my husband was completely freaked out because he was really up. So that was the first thing that really happened to him there. And he was completely freaked out. And he, that's when we both started talking about how we just thought we'd seen something out of the corner of our eye. We were both noticing that over the, you know, in that bedroom. Wow. So you're not, now we're talking about experiencing poltergeist activity in the house as well. Oh yeah, there was, there was definitely poltergeist activity. And my husband, when um, he was working on the house, he he was was into construction. He would um, be making working on it, and he would set his beer down, at, at, and you know he'd have it sitting there. And almost all the every time he he turned his back, the beer would be knocked over. Whatever it was, did not like <laughs> drinking or whatever, because his beers would always fall over. His tools were always coming up missing. He'd set them down. They'd be gone when they came back. We'd have to go look for them. Um, you know, about, and then yeah. other, there's a couple other big incidents with the light that, that came down. So we had, I'm, I don't know if you have, you probably know the kind of lights they use generally in a, a hallway where you, um, Put, you know, it's your, like a big glass bowl. bowl, yeah, with a they screw on and you can sure. reach over the top and put light bulbs in. So, um, one time we were in the kitchen, the house was under construction, and um, but we weren't working on that, we we're doing countertops and floors. Um, and um, we were talking, we were kind of in a little bit of an argument, and um, the um, light, the first one, just it just came down. We hadn't touched it. It just, it almost hit him in the head. That whole bulb thing just dropped. Um, and he was pretty upset about that. He actually was so upset about it. He was kind of accusing me of having some kind of telekinesis. Cause we, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was really upset. He could not believe this light just came off the ceiling for no reason. There was no logical reason it should come off the ceiling. Um, and then the next thing was we were, um, we this at the when these lights were coming down, the house was under some pretty major construction. So we had torn off the back wall of the house because we found out it had some dry rot, rebuilt it. And at that time, this very old house, a lot of the old houses had stairways that went on the outside of the house with the entrance to the basement, you know, on the back side, and you go in outside. So we had taken all that apart, closed up that basement entrance, and redone some of the entrances, put the basement entrance in the house, so kind of in the middle of the house. I think you can see on that diagram. And really switched things around so that um, there was another chandelier that was in the former dining room that we had actually put up. It wasn't one that it came with the house, but um, it was also one where you never touch the glass. It hung down and you'd reach in. So there was no reason to ever undo the glass or anything. It actually had quite a few screws that were holding it on. And we were standing there talking about some issues about what we're doing with the house. And that light actually came undone from the, the chandelier. It came down and it, it touched the floor, did not break, came back up to the height of me, which I'm about five foot three. And then it came back down again and it didn't break. It came back down on the floor. On Mexican tile. Yes. It, <laughs> floor. Yeah, we had put in a um, you know, hard floor. It was tile. It wasn't carpet or anything. It wasn't encoded and in rubber, was it? No. <laughs> no, it was Jeez. like crystal glass yes. chandelier. Yes. Bowl. It actually scared scared us very badly. And I, so much so that I wouldn't even put the light back up again. It sat in a box for about the next eight years until I finally just gave it away to the Goodwill. Um, even though it was a really expensive light I had purchased myself. Um, 
Then there was another light that was similar to the one in the kitchen that was just a regular hallway light where you reach in. You don't unscrew it, you know, at all to change the light bulb. And um, my husband and I were actually having another little bit heated discussion and about the construction in the house and what we're doing. And that light also just came off of the ceiling and it almost hit him in the head. It came down and it hit the the side of the coffee table and it made um, a pretty deep dent because it was a very, very heavy glass fixture and it um, made a huge dent in the coffee table. Um, We'd been sitting on the couch. So so it could have really hurt somebody. Yes, it could have really hurt somebody. Yeah, and it it almost hit them. (laughs) And so I didn't put any of those lights back up. We put completely different kinds of fixture. I mean, I was paranoid of light. I didn't understand why these things were happening. Um, some other things happened with lights too. I don't know if you want to hear about that, but I, yeah, I most of the time I didn't let Kendall sleep by herself when she was little. Cause when we first moved in, I had a really bad feeling about the house and I couldn't really explain why at first because nothing had happened to me. But so I had had her taking her nap. She was a little, little girl, um, about two and a half in my room on my bed. And I had all the lights on. And it was during the day and she was sleeping on my bed and it had, I hadn't left her for very long. And, and I walked in there and I had a ceiling fan with um, three or four light bulbs in it and the light was on. And when, as soon as I walked in the room, all of the light bulbs, um, just they made this big poppy noise and they all went out at the same time. Right over the top of Kendall. Too. I mean, the, the fan was kind of over the top of my bed. Wow. So it definitely sounds like, I mean, what you're doing right now is, to me at least, and you may not be meaning to do this, so I mean, definitely let me know, but it sounds like you're painting a picture of something going on in the house that really wasn't that friendly. No. (laughs) No, a lot of it was meant to scare. Um, I think with the um, the first talking, the the first doll (laughs) incident uh, was when Kendall doesn't remember because she was so little. Um, At the beginning, a lot of it was I was directed at me. Um, it might have been, she was so little, she wouldn't have been able to explain a lot of things if it was directed at her. Um, I wouldn't leave her alone very often. I was with her a lot because of some things, but um, I wouldn't let her sleep in her room because I was worried about it because it gave me a bad feeling. And then I did start experiencing things. She had a doll that was given to her by her grandmother. And it was just like a little stuff thing with one of those pull strings that had no batteries or anything. And this, I had it sitting, it was a little bit too much for her when she was little to play with. So um, she got it for her birthday. So I put it up kind of on a higher shelf in the room, in her bedroom. And so um, I was there all day. I wasn't working for a couple of years. And so we'd be there all day, no problem. But at, at night, um, you know, when everything was dark and I'd have to walk by her bedroom door to get to my bedroom. And this only happened at night and it would only happen to me for some reason, although other people would be in the house. That doll would, um, and you had to pull the string to make it talk, but it would talk. It would say that it's saying it would go peekaboo. I see you peekaboo. I love you. And it would say it right when I passed by in the dark. And like I said, it only did it at night. And it didn't do it very many times before it was no longer in the house. Yeah, but I, mean, I could I not figure out how that could even happen. You had to pull the string to make it work. It was not a battery operated toy. It was. Yeah. And that was that one. I don't remember, you know, because I was so little, but the, there was another talking doll incident. Um, it was right after Toy Story. The first one came out. And I had gotten, I don't know, Lightyear. for Christmas or something, um, I got Buzz Lightyear, Woody, and Jesse, the, you know, the dolls from the movie. And Buzz Lightyear did have batteries and everything, but, um, and you could push the, these buttons and it would say catchphrases like, like, I come in peace and um, up, 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 up in a way or whatever it said, you know. But you'd click the buttons and it would be random, like it would say it different, different thing time. every time you pressed it. And I remember this because I was old enough to remember. You're about nine. And um, me and my mom and Casey were at home alone at night because my dad had a job where he, he traveled, traveled a week. lot. Yeah. And um, so we were home alone. And Casey was, I don't know if she was asleep, or she, but she was really little, so she wouldn't remember. But um, we were all laying there, and we're about to go to sleep when all of a sudden we hear Buzz Lightyear in the living room say, I come in peace. And 
uh, my mom got up and she went into the living room to look at the, you know, the doll and, you know, maybe it was in the toy box underneath a bunch of stuff and the cat jumped on it or something. And, um, but no, it was sitting right on top, you know, nothing was pressing the buttons or anything. And she went back in and she was like, okay, well, that's weird. And, um, went back and laid down. And then as soon as she laid down and closed her eyes, I come in peace it happened again. And she went out there and she looked at it and stared at it for a while and pressed the buttons to see if it would say it again. And it would say something different. Like it didn't say I come in peace ever. And then she went back and laid down and it happened again. And as I remember, cause I was awake cause my mom was getting up and I kept hearing it, you know, happen. And so after that, my mom just picked it up and put it on the front porch. And then we got rid of it the next day. <laughs> Jeez. So you got, you got stuff flying around the house. You got dolls talking. Uh, it's definitely, this house definitely had some bad juju on it. And I mean, for me, at least this is on an outside perspective. To me, it doesn't seem like maybe Ted wasn't so innocent. I don't know. Like I know you, you said that you thought there was two different entities. Uh, what made you feel that the, the negative things going on around the house wasn't Ted? Well, Ted, for one, liked my dad. You know, he, he helped my, or my dad helped him around the house and stuff when he got older and he was, you know, my uncle's nephew. So, I mean, he, he always liked my dad. Um, and things didn't really, I mean, besides the tools going missing sometimes, you know, while they were doing construction, stuff happened to my dad, but not like they happened to us. They didn't affect my dad. Um, if you, you know, in the same way physically than they did to us. Um, and as far as seeing things and hearing things and stuff like that. Um, and so, I mean, I don't think, I don't think that Ted would have done anything like that negative stuff. Uh, and I, I don't know if that it was Ted or if it was, you know, another entity, because sometimes you would get feelings when stuff would happen and you wouldn't be scared. Other times things would happen and you would be terrified. Like when I was a kid and staying in that bedroom, for example, um, one of the other first things I remember is hearing hissing and snakes under my bed. And I always thought that it was like the heater or something, but the heater wouldn't be on. And, you know, there was no vent or anything under my bed <laughs> um, and stuff. And that would, you know, you would get like a horrible, terrified feeling. And the fact that, you know, when my parents were in arguments or something, you know, and things would be directed at my dad, um, you know, the lights falling down, almost hitting him and stuff like that. Uh, it was almost more of like a, uh, like a stop arguing or protective kind of a thing, you know, um, whereas the other stuff that was happening where you could feel the, the bad then that's why we think there's two different things because there's totally different feelings between them. If something broke my, some of my favorite, um, I have a Fiesta Wear collection and it did it on purpose, um, broke some of the pieces. I can explain that if you care to hear a bit. Um, it was definitely something mean directed right at me because I told it to stop. That's interesting. I mean, so... I, I, to me, it sounds like there there probably was more than one entity going on. I mean, two at least. Uh, I mean, you're seeing, you know, a dog like entity at one time. Uh, you're seeing this owl like entity, which I I'm telling you, I don't like the owl entity. I, I just don't like it. I don't I don't like the fact that of what it could represent, uh, and the, not to mention the pentagram in the backyard. Uh, so there there's some weird stuff going on at that house, but in the email. You said that it seemed like it followed you. What did you mean by that? Um, okay, well, we can get into more recent events if you'd like after we move. Okay. Um, if that's okay. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Um, kind of move past the house. Cause... So, all right. Um, when we moved, at first I was very upset that we were moving because, you know, it was my, even though it was a horrible house, it was all I ever knew and all my friends and stuff in Portland because we moved far. We moved like state away we moved from portland oregon to uh nampa idaho and um so but i eventually got over it and everything and um when i didn't realize how 
horrible that house the you know once you left you you feel the weight come off right um when you leave like a bad situation or something you know what i mean and um anyway so we moved here and i remember the first few months we were living here um you know it was like heaven you know it was like how life should have felt the whole time you know just you're generally happy you know you're not afraid to walk around the house at night you know it's just very easy easy living then um me and my mom started having dreams of the house and they still continue. I, I had one a couple months ago, um, darn near close to the exact time the house actually got torn down. Um, my mom would have dreams that the house was like reaching out almost to her. And I would have just dreams of being inside the house, um, you know, where it's dark nighttime, you know, not happy feeling. And Um, so that's one thing. And the the last dream that I had was actually kind of, um, disturbing to me because I, you know, I want it to be dead and gone, (laughs) but, um, I dreamt that the house I was standing, have you ever seen the movie Coraline? Have you ever seen that movie? No. Okay. Well, maybe you look it up later on something on YouTube, but there's a scene where Coraline goes through the, the, the portal in the house or whatever, and she's walking away from the the house and um, the thing in the movie um, kind of builds a a world for Coraline because she wants her to stay there. So she only built what she thought would impress Coraline. And so she was walking away from the house. So it was like when she walked away from the house, everything started to disappear. Like the house disappeared and she was in a white world. Like nothing, nothing was there. It was just, she was in like a green screen almost. And then she walked in a circle and the house started reappearing. So in my dream, um, the house I was standing in, it was kind of gray and I was looking around kind of in a circle and I started to turn around and all of a sudden the yard, I was in the backyard in the dream and the grass started appearing underneath me and the shed appeared first. And then the house, it kind of like came colored in up from the ground up and then the scenery showed up in it, it like it never got torn down. Um, it was like, it was saying it was still there and we didn't even know it got, we, yeah. And I didn't even know it had gotten torn down. We had only learned that after my aunt came, because my half my family still lives in Oregon and my aunt has to drive past that old house all the time because her work is over there. And she came down to visit us, um, in September or August. Mm. And she said, oh yeah, your guys' old house got torn down. And I was like, what? (laughs) No way. (laughs) Because I had no idea, you know. Is that in my dream, I was like, that's really, that's really weird that I had that dream because the house was gone and then it was there again. Yeah. But anyway, so the, the dreams were happening where the house was like following us. And um, then we started having things happen here at our new house. Um, actually, quite recently, it started to pick up a lot. But um, so the first thing I can have my mom kind of tell you about it, there was a shadow person talking to her from across the fence behind our house (laughs) yeah so that's super super bizarre and that's one of those things that that happened just to me and it's one of those things you're like did that really happen I mean I know what happened but it's um I let my dog out it was dark but it wasn't late it was like 7 7 30 dark and the dog was uh, barking I couldn't I let him have to go to the bathroom and we live in a neighborhood and I can't have him barking like that so I walked out there and he was just really upset barking at the fence and I walked over there and I'm telling him to stop, you know, and um, I was just staring at what he was looking at. And right on the other side of the fence from me, we have a, a chain link fence. You could see through it. Um, all of a sudden I saw what he was looking at. It was just a black thing. Like a black it was Yeah, it was a, black, a person shape, but it was black. It was, I didn't, it was just. It was a shadow, the yeah. only thing you can describe it as. And so all of a sudden, while I'm looking at this, I'm stunned. I was just staring, and I, I, tried, I was holding the dog with my arm, and he's just barking. And all of a sudden, as clear as can be, I hear the neighbor who lives farther. Oh, 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 it's our neighbor, but he's not, like, right next door to cross the canal. He starts talking to me and asking me questions. But um, it's dark, and there's no reason. you can't even hear him. And I'm talking to him and looking at this thing, and I did, I couldn't see. I was kind of looking around like, where is he? 
And I didn't see where he was. And Os- and my dog Oscar is still going crazy. And he's asking me how uh, my how our life's going and this kind of stuff. And the whole thing was just really, really weird. And um, and then I'll, then the entity backed up. And I, and I was also trying to see where that neighbor was because I'm like, does he see this thing? He's uh, talking to me. And Kendall seems to think I never did see the neighbor that that, that I was actually talking to the thing. Um, because there would have been no reason for our neighbor to be right up next to our fence. I mean, he was right. It sounded like he was right next to me talking. And um, so the thing backs up slowly and I, and I, I'm just stunned watching it kind of talk, the na- you know, talking, to answering questions and it starts to back up. And then the neighbor stops talking or what I think the neighbor stops talking, that thing backs up and runs across the street and then crouches down in the shadows and it's just gone. It's lost in the shadow. Mm-hmm. And wow. I don't know what that was the weirdest thing I, out of all the things I've seen. That was probably one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. I for I always thought it was the neighbor talking. Kendall doesn't seem to think it was the neighbor. I never saw the neighbor. Because our neighbor, that neighbor, his house is probably, I don't know, 50 or 80 feet away, like his fence. Because there's, I don't know if you know, I don't know if there's big canals where you live. But here in Idaho, sure. they use canal irrigation. And so there's one literally like our fence is next to the canal like it backs up to the canal there's maybe like three feet in of ground in between the the side of our fence and where the water would be and so and then on the other side of that is houses in a little another branch of the canal that goes through the neighborhood and so his house is like 50 or 80 feet to his yard from our fence and so for him he would have to yell you know for him to hear her or for her to hear him you know as clear as she did yeah, it sounds like he was standing right there. And I, I honestly, I, it was the weirdest. I don't even know yeah. what to say. It was like he was standing there. It was like the thing was standing there. I didn't see the neighbor. I just yeah. heard him talk. And he's yeah. like, a he. well, he doesn't live there anymore. But he was like a single guy that only came out during the day. Not, not saying like he was a weirdo or anything, but he, he was never <laughs> outside after dark. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> and the, yeah, the dog was absolutely going crazy and I couldn't get him to stop. He's a big, big black dog, you know, just crazy upset. And, but that was one, that was like one of the first things that I remember happening here. And then at the other house, um, my little sister, Casey, she never had anything. Nothing seemed to affect her. You know, it was either directed at me or my mom, um, or sometimes my dad, um, and when we moved here, I was, uh, you know, I was older when we moved here. I was like 17. So when I was 18, I moved out um, with my boyfriend. So I, you know, wasn't here and for a long time. And Casey started having problems um, in her room. Um, there was this is your old room. Yeah, it used to be when we first moved here, it was my room. Um, but she sees actually she um, so she started having dreams of demons in her room. Um, she actually drew the demon that she saw with these tattoos on it. And we could probably redraw it and find it for you or you could look it up, but she drew the Leviathan demon and the tattoos that were on it matched uh, the, um, the symbols or the, the Leviathan cross or the Satan cross or something. Wow. Um, we, we took a while to find it online, but we found it. And, um, yeah. And actually the picture she drew, cause she's really good at art. She's amazing. Um, for, you know, a teenager, she's really, really good. And she re- recreated it for us And that picture that she drew disappeared. Um, she, you know, kept it somewhere in her desk drawer or something, or it was, de- oh, it was, it was down, down here. here on the table. And I set it down here. I, I wanted to put it somewhere cause it was scary to look at, but I was, I wanted to research it some more and the thing disappeared. Yeah. We have not found it to this day. And, um, between me and Casey now there's this, there was this weird thing cause I was working um, right now I'm an Uber driver, but I was working for another kind of taxi company with my fiance and, um, it was late at night, you know, we worked through the night. So I was, we were parked waiting to get a run and my mom, it wasn't super late. It was, I don't know, it was dark out. So it was probably like nine, maybe yeah, we were nine there. o'clock and Casey and my mom were upstairs in her bedroom and my mom was in the bathroom, in, in the doing bathroom. Makeup stuff. We were just, you know, doing yeah. girl, makeup girl stuff in the bathroom, just doing hair and stuff. And, um, I was sitting in the car and I, it was, it was really, it was, I've never experienced anything like it. And it's kind of hard to describe, but I'll do my best. 
Um, so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't super tired, but you know, I have to work till four in the morning. So I might as well shut my eyes when I can. And so I, I shut my eyes. And as soon as I shut my eyes, you know how, like, if you close your eyes during the daytime and you look at the sun, it's kind of red and yellow, you know, you can see that color. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So it was like, it was almost like something was, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Like, um, peeking through my vision almost, um, or like in my head, I don't know if it was, but it seemed like I was looking at it cause it was the red and yellow background, even though it was dark outside. So there was no, you know, there was no lights or anything that would be shining in my eyes while they're closed. And, um, it was almost like a veil or something like he, this thing, this face, it was like, um, like a, like a, I don't know how to, like a goblin type face. I want to say it was kind of green and it had yellow eyes and it kind of peeked down and was pulled it, pulled, pulled, like just looked up. I could only see half its face while my eyes were shut and I could see the yellow eyes. That was very distinctive. It was, it had yellow eyes and greenish skin that was kind of, it wasn't human skin. It was, it was more like wrinkly or something, how you would picture in the movie, like, like a, a gargoyle or something, you know? And at the same time, I guess my little sister was facing me behind my mom. So she was looking at my mom. Okay. I was in the bathroom doorway and she was looking at me this way. And you just texted me a note saying, I just even hitting it to touch it. Cause you said you were upset. You wanted me to talk to you or something. Yeah. Cause it had upset me, you know, seeing that. Cause I, and I, as soon as I saw that thing and watched it in my vision for a minute, I opened my eyes and I freaked out, you know, and I told my fiance, but he he's not very interested <laughs> in paranormal stuff. He's never really had experiences. Um, but uh, so I texted my mom and I told her that I wanted her to, I wanted to talk to her about it. And right as I texted my mom, she was opening the text that I just sent her about the thing. She hadn't even read it yet. Um, my sister turned, you know, got pale white stunned and she saw a thing in in the bathroom walk behind yeah something in the bathroom walk behind my mom with yellow eyes the and same she, she saw more of what it looked like she said it was wearing she actually said it was wearing old time looking clothes um she and she talked about like pinstripe pants with a cusp thing with the weird eyes the same as you described yeah. in the same color skin weird yellow eyes green skin with pinstriped cuffed pants like you'd think like an old rail, rail worker oh, guy old time outfit. outfit you know kind of a thing would wear um so yeah that that happened <laughs> to Casey so stuff started happening to her when we moved here along with the demon stuff and um uh like things would fly around her room um like hats she would put up on top of the like bookcase thing that she has in her room she would put hats and stuff up there that she would come back to her room and it'd be in the middle of the floor which is impossible <laughs> she doesn't allow the animals to be in her room we do have cats but she does not allow them to be in her room so she always has her door closed at all times so um, i'm always open to you know checking and making sure it wasn't something else first yeah but the, the hats won't stay up there she had a horn a large horn that she had gotten that was pretty heavy that would stay up on the shelf but it wouldn't stay there it would end up in the middle of the floor all the time yeah what kind and of then, horn was this um I, it, it was some. it was like a bull horn you know like you know how um like those flat horns oh it's like the texas longhorns you know they put on the front of old cadillac <laughs> yeah you know what i'm talking about <laughs> the, yeah. like texas guys would put one of those she had one of those. Okay. There's only gotcha. half of it that went to both of them. Wow. So, I mean, you guys are experiencing a lot of crap still after you moved. Uh, do you have any inkling as to why that is? I mean, do you, do you ever feel like uh, there's something about you guys that's attractive to, to latch on to? Have you ever thought about that? Um, yeah. Well... There, there is something um, that I think is a, a huge part of it. I don't know. Um, it kind of has to do with the family um, as far as the paranormal stuff. I don't think the UFO stuff has anything to do with this, but the paranormal stuff, um, yes. In, in our family history, there's a lot of sketchy religious 
thing. Um, for example, I won't name the church that they went to, but my family on both sides, my dad's side and my mom's side went to a cult uh, type church um, that claimed they were Christian, but they would hold mass and Masonic lodges. And um, it was very, you couldn't wear makeup. You couldn't be friends with people outside the church. Um, you know, if you, you know, did. It was cultish, but they did follow the Bible. I can't say that we ever did. No, there was nothing like outright satanic or anything like that about it. They did follow the Bible and everything. But it, was they, cultish, it was just very so weird that they were was- allowed to be where they were. and And then on top of that, my great grandmother's second husband was um, a Freemason. We found my mom or grandma found his ring, which they only give to the higher. Well, yeah, he uh, had a special <laughs> ring that he wore. Special ring, and he got really angry when they found when she found it because he did not want her to know that he was part of that. Yeah, and and my grandma had a lot of odd experiences going back that I can't speak to because it all happened before I was born. My mom knows about it, but she does not want to talk about it, unfortunately, very much. Yeah. And my grandma, my mom's mom, um, she had, if she tries to talk about things that happened to her in her house as a kid, she goes into complete um, breakdown mode. Um, Like, I'm not saying this is anything bad, but, you know, she'll, she'll just start saying, you know, like Jesus Christ is my savior and she'll rock kind of back and forth and she won't, she can't talk about it. Um, so I don't know in her brother, her younger brother was, I don't know, 10, 10 years younger, 15 years younger than her. Um, than my grandma and the house that he grew up in with my great grandma, she said that after, or he said that after my grandma moved out, um, it was impossible to sleep in there because uh, there would be there's something sitting in the corner of the bedroom watching you sleep mm-hmm. and my grandma had similar experiences where she said you could hear them coming with a whoosh and they'd peek around, they'd the, corner. Peek around the corner at you while you're in your room the way she described the entities that I heard sounded more like what you how you would describe aliens to me than than ghosts yeah but like I said she does not like to talk about it and it's not something I was ever, I, even though I'm really, really interested because of everything that's happened over our life, um, I, she did not want to talk about it. Yeah. And based on that, um, I mean, there's that half of the family. Um, and then on my mom's dad's side, he just had crazy weird experiences. Just, just you know, he didn't bring any, any of them on, but, you know, he like he was followed by UFOs. He um, you know, was hired by a coven of witches. <laughs> hold on a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Your dad was hired by a coven of witches. Well, well, yeah, okay, well, okay. My, my father worked in a company that happened to have quite a few that worked there. That wasn't their main business. <laughs> yeah. So he uh-huh. crossed them. Yeah. He crossed them and, um, so they would find angry. things buried in the yard. Like my grandpa's watch would go missing. He w- he found it buried in the yard it, years it later. Was missing at work. Blow darts were blown at his head uh, at the house. <laughs> yeah, there's just there's a lot of things that I don't know how to piece together with him. So it's um, so hard. You can see how there's so many different avenues that things that are happening to us could be coming from. You know. I'll tell you. One thing I don't know a whole lot about it, but one of the things is uh, the owl pops up a lot in the Freemasonry imagery. So I don't know if there's a connection with that as well. But I mean, you saying that uh, maybe that's part of the reason why you guys are experiencing this stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, but uh, it's. I'll tell you, it's very interesting. I mean, I have a feeling you guys could go for hours with all these stories it's unbelievable i mean it's like as soon as you guys share one story the other one remembers something it's it's unbelievable uh what, what's the state of your family right now with all this stuff do you, it is it something that you guys all are willing to openly talk about and discuss when things happen or is it more like eh, let's just not really talk about it um yeah no we we discuss it between us um you know within the family my grandparents like my grandparents are old now. My grandpa used to, you know, be just like me. 
Um, he actually got me into, you know, like stuff like your show and learning about things that are, you know, you know, like abnormal. (laughs) Um, but he, he is getting on an age now and he, it kind of scares him to talk about it now because I, I think he's, yeah, I don't know if he's worried about things starting to happen again when he's old. Um, so we, I try not to talk to him yeah, about it anymore. Him it upsets him. I mean, he used to be very, yeah, he, he, he was yeah. very into it. He was like, I mean, if he could have a talk show, <laughs> he would have one. But um, yeah, so between all of us, um, yeah, we, we do discuss it. I mean, stuff, I mean, this week has been happening. And yeah, because I mean, I just, I, I want to know why. And I haven't ever been able to figure out why. And my dad kind of passed that to me because he could never figure out why. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, we talk about it a lot. And with the Freemason thing, the owl thing that you're talking about and everything, it makes sense to me that that could be a lot of it because we were, we've kind of thrown around the idea of like a generational kind of curse yeah. type thing. Like if someone way back in the day, you know, before my great grandma or something, because they've been in this that church in stuff well, for a long with time my great grandma yeah i mean there's a lot of weird things like my mother's father was um told that um told my mom and my dad that he has his own religion he would not discuss it and um you know he said what he wanted to be done after he died you know where he wanted to be cremated and his ashes to go in a certain spot and he he just said that I have my own religion. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I I never could figure out that's why I never saw him be religious in any way, and um, I never could figure that out exactly. It was very strange. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, before we get out of here, I would like for you to kind of share with us what happened this week. You referenced that things have even happened this week, and I got to ask, what happened this week? Um. So some of it's good and some of it's horrible also. Um, So I've mentioned that my fiance has never had experiences, right? But both me, he's bound to have one eventually. Um, But he, I was at his house um, and things have just been like going missing. Mm -hmm. Like my mom accused me of taking her hairbrush when I, I did take her hairbrush, but it disappeared from my room. And then a couple days later, it, showed up inside her drawer like like as if you had just without opening the drawer put it in there so you can't open the drawer again you know to get it out yeah um so it appeared in there and then we lost our clicker like we wouldn't put our clicker anywhere um we wouldn't put our clicker anywhere weird you know but it it was gone to our brand like we just got fire tv or whatever from amazon and I love it. And so that clicker disappeared and then it just reappeared back on the counter for no reason, you know, in the middle middle of everything. After searching the entire living room and everywhere through every chair, it just showed up all of a sudden it was just sitting there. Yeah. And then my fiance's smartwatch that we lost, literally we were like 50 miles away camping and he lost it while we were camping, um, appeared in his room, um, just yesterday. And then, so those are kind of good things, I guess, because we got our stuff back. But um, this week, I don't know if you're familiar with the three knocks, um, but it, uh, I don't know. This is yeah. kind of more of superstitious, but this uh, a death knock. And um, I didn't really put the, that together, but I was at my fiance's house um, and we were laying in the bedroom and I hear this really loud, like as if you took your flat hand and banged on the wall. So it kind of made a hollow sound but really loud, um, three bangs. And the way my fiance's um, dad's house is, is um, like his bedroom door and the back door are like two corners of a square, you know, of the hallway. So his bedroom door and his back door are right next to each other. And so Christian jumped up because it was really late at night and um, he ran out and opened the door to the back door and there was nobody there. And he ran to the front door and no one was there either. And he was like, that was really weird, you know? And I texted my mom and I told her what happened. And then um, just a couple of days ago, um, our, my dog and our cat got in a fight. He broke her jaw and we had to put her down um, a couple of days ago. And so that is just, I don't know that that could just be coincidence, but it, you know, it hardly ever is with stuff like that. Um, So that happened 
And then the same night, my mom got a job offer (laughs) from this place that she wanted. So it was just very weird that everything is happening all at the same time, horrible and good. And um, yeah, and then just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, my mom saw a shadow person in the living room. So, I mean, it's all just kind of happening (laughs) right now. Wow. Well, Kendall, Rachel, you guys have a very interesting life that you just shared with us. And uh, I'm very excited about sharing this show with the people because uh, it has so many different aspects to it, twists and turns and uh, different stories from minor things to pretty major. Uh, Before we get out of here, I want to ask you, Kendall, going all the way back to the old house, when that owl kind of like flew, I think you described it through your face. Did you feel Mm -hmm. that at all? Did, what, did it hurt? Did you feel anything? It didn't hurt. It was it was almost like um, wind going through your shirt. You know how when you're standing there and you can feel the wind and it's not as strong as outside your shirt, you know, on your bare skin, but you can feel it on your skin underneath your shirt. Sure. If that makes sense. That's what it felt like. And it was it it was. Like it wasn't super cold or anything, but it was is lower than my body temperature and I could feel it and it had force to it. And it, I didn't see it like sitting there when I entered, but when I turned, it was there and it was immediately rushing at me and it pushed me back, you know, like I fell back into the wall right behind me. Um, and it, I, I don't know, cause it was, it was very strange because after that, I felt like I couldn't, um, it, I don't know. It just, it almost felt like it took something. Uh, that's the only way I could describe that. Um, it, it, it felt like it took um, like some ability or, you know what I mean? Cause I, I, me and my mom were always very sensitive to stuff and it, I felt very dull after that drained and stuff. And like on that with me and my mom, like, I was having a hard time at that time and I would sneak out, you know, and that my mom always knew that I would sneak out and, um, for no reason, like there, she, there would be no reason for her to know that I was sneaking out of the house. And she, um, anyway, every, every time that I would sneak out, she would just wake up and figure out that I was gone, you know, out of my room. And she just knew that I was gone and she texted me and telling me, you know, come home. And then, so like after a while, I, um, you know, would, I learned that if I didn't feel nervous about it, like I tested it, if I didn't feel nervous or I didn't feel like I was projecting that kind of energy, like worried about her finding out she would never find out. But every time I did, and I'd let myself feel nervous, she would. (laughs) So like that kind of stuff kind of stopped happening after that. Like I, I, we didn't have that as strong of a connection after the owl incident, the last thing that happened with that after that. So yeah, I feel like it kind of, I don't know if it drained energy from me or something, but yeah, yeah, it it did that. (laughs) Wow. Well, I really appreciate you ladies coming on and sharing some of these stories. I I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for having us on. I'm so, I'm so happy we got to come on. Awakened from the forest in the depths of the abyss, this creature is a paradigm of time lost and time itself. It fears no one. It adheres to no rule that man can create. It forges its own path and yet its path remains hidden from the world. The sphere of its existence is beyond most comprehension as it exudes its power quietly but transcendent. It needs no one's approval to exist, but yet its very existence is sought after by many. It watches. It learns. Adapts to the ever-changing environment around it, even as the environment is wrought with corruption. It battles the corruption only when pressed or for the protection of others like it. It is a mirage that few will ever understand. It's a cornucopia of knowledge from an era long past. It's free. 
It's Bigfoot. My fantasies always consisted of making it big. My soul was nothing more than a bargaining chip. Marketing is what they tell you to do and what you're willing to give. Larking to the fullest extent. I don't wait, I shoot first like Han on a rodeo. And these people don't understand me like reading a Nokia and stretch thin. Like pulling an accordion, my heart ain't primordium. All these historians telling us lies, setting aside everything is medicalized. Politicians selling the ride, I better me die. Where the relevance lies, they dressing a light. Reptilians, my resilience is brilliant. I'm here to lead the rebellion on Hellion, salient, alien with no melanin. I'm a Yeti, ain't hiding from Armageddon. Come and find me, I ain't even hiding. We ain't the same, I play no games. You do not know. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.